Hi, it's Colleen and welcome back to my channel. This video is part two of a two-part series on the making of this project right here. It's an 18th century cassequin, which is a short skirted jacket that has pleats around the bottom. I had a lot of fun puzzling out how to draft this pattern and so I show that process in part one. Make sure you go and watch that first. But now let's just jump right into finishing up this project and you'll see a few other things I made along the way. It's a new day, therefore I have new indecisiveness. This is a sleeve from Simplicity 8161. I thought about extending it and then played around with that and ended up back to just about where it started in the first place. So there is a dart that goes from here to the end and then this hits right at the inside of your elbow. This gets like tacked onto the sleeve. So you complete this with two layers and all the seams would be finished, obviously. You complete the whole thing and then you tack it on right about here. So I just wanted to try something different than the ruffle I did last time, but this is creating all kinds of doubt for me. This is the dimension and style shown in Patterns of Fashion and provided by American Duchess. It just looks huge. This really hangs out the back here, but I think that was common. I have been playing around with whether this should be just a little bit shorter. Um, I may go that route, but the other thing I am checking in on is this. So the other day I was loving how it looked. I was happy, happy, happy. And then I started looking at the pictures and it is not level. It's shorter toward the front and longer toward the back, which again, might be just fine. I just am not sure and I'm second guessing myself. So before I cut out my main fabric, which is in limited supply, I need to have these things absolutely certain. Once I cut the stuff out, I can't change, right? I could shorten it, but I can't put it back on. I have enough fabric for the bodice for sure. It's how I handle the sleeves. That will remain to be seen. Here's my next dilemma. I have this really odd shaped piece, and then I have two pieces that are that wide, and then I have some scraps. So technically there's plenty of fabric for me to cut out these pieces on the grain line that I need them to be. What I'm seeing is there is no hope for pattern matching. I can make mirror images of the front and I can make mirror images of the back, but I cannot do anything about these skirt pieces lining up with the front or the back because of the way the grain line works. So this has to be cut on the straighter grain, which is this way. This has to be cut on this grain line. See, so that goes straight there and this goes straight here. So there's no way that this right here will ever match up to this part of the fabric. I guess I'm trying to figure out what the most important things are to match. And I'm assuming it's the center back. I mean, I have plenty of fabric and that's the good news. So no problems there, but I'm just trying to figure out how to make the best use of it. I wanted to share how I did the pattern matching on this. So I took this piece of fabric and laid it over this piece of fabric until the pattern matches. And then I folded back a good healthy seam allowance right there. And while it was pinned to the larger piece, I laid my pattern on there and traced this out. And I made sure to put this on the seam line on the pattern, not on the seam allowance, but on the seam line. Now what I can do is fold this over and I have marked right along in this crease what the seam line should be. Now I can flip it this way and match up the pattern right along the seam line and pin through it and use this as a guide for cutting it out. And then I can sew up this back seam right along that line and then trim the seam allowance. It's been several days since I worked on this project and here's where I left off. I cut and seamed the center back and matched the pattern pretty darn well if you ask me. So there's that and I am ready now to attach the two front pieces and work on the skirt. Now we're going to stitch the lining to the outside fabric right sides together along the front top and other front edge. So we're gonna leave the, the arm size loose for now and the bottom loose for now. I'm just gonna stitch along here. I'll clip the curves and then turn it and press it, then baste the arm side and then leave this bottom part free until we attach the skirt. Here are my four skirt pieces pinned together. 
And now I'm going to join them into one long piece and then pleat them up. This fabric frays badly and I will feel much better once I get all the seams enclosed. The other issue is that there are a lot of bias edges on this skirt um, and I don't want to handle it too much because I don't want it to fray but I also don't want it to stretch. And I suppose stay stitching would have solved that problem but I'm kind of a lazy sewer. I am going to be very careful on this because I cannot cut a new one. I am out of fabric at this point, uh, or at least pieces that are big enough for this. So I did clip in where the folds are going to be, and this is my lining piece. I'm going to pin up along all the edges, and I'm going to stitch along the outside and all around the bottom, right sides together. Then I'll turn it, press it, and do my very best to match up all these little notches and fold it like I folded it on my mock-up. This is this piece right here. And I know that this goes to the seam so I can pull this one over to the seam. This is where I hope I've really done it right because I will be very sad <laughs> if I've gotten to this point and there is a problem. So now let's do the other side the same way. Okay, I think I have it. You can see these are where my pleats are. So those are gonna be really pretty right across the back of that little rump that I've got. Before I put this onto the jacket, I am going to baste all of this down. What I learned on my other one is I need to baste it down below the seam allowance because if I baste it here, they still might separate when they go through the machine. So I need to baste it down further than a half inch, right there. And I can pull those stitches out when I'm done. Once I attach it to the skirt, the seam will be right about here. And I can just pick out all of that. Oh, this is exciting to see it finally come together. And it has nice body to it with the two layers of fabric. Yeah, that's going to be just fine. Okay, I stitched up the sleeves, which is actually, you know, that's an easy part, right? So they're sewn. They're ready to put on the bodice. However, I'm going to make these cuffs right here. So this is basically, it's a tube that you would be able to see through. So you need to have a ruffle or something to sort of fill in the gap from what I understand. My shift has a ruffle on it and it's kind of a beige colored linen. And I'm not sure, first of all, I'm not sure I'm gonna keep that shift because I'm not really happy with the way it works. And the second thing is this is black and I think it might look nice to have a black ruffle that's just tacked to the inside of the sleeve. I think in order to do that and be sure about finishing the sleeve, I probably need to get my black linen figured out because I also need to make a black stomacher. And I was going to go ahead and make a new petticoat. I'm gonna show you my problem currently with my black linen. This is a rectangular piece of linen right here. And you can see it's fairly sheer. It's not long enough to do a full petticoat out of. It would be too short, so I would need to add a ruffle or something. I have this linen, which is much a much better weight. It's not nearly as sheer as the other one, but they are similar enough that you can't really tell that they are not the same when they're next to each other. But this piece of the heavier linen has this big chunk taken out of it right here. So if I try to cut it from here, the whole petticoat will be too short. If I leave it on this line right here, it's fine. But then if I cut that off lengthwise, it will be too narrow. So I'm going to do the 18th century thing and piece a chunk. I have this sort of weird chunk here to the edge that I can cut off and use to do that. That would look a little funny at the bottom of my petticoat, except that then I can make a ruffle out of the other linen that is long enough to cover that bit of piecing. So that's what I'm going to do. And then out of the other piece, I should have enough to make a ruffle for the sleeves as well as a new stomacher. I am in a no buy Whole30 for my fabric stash. I am not gonna buy any fabric for this. So while these are not ideal, and it might be nice to just go buy linen, I'm not doing it because I'm on a Whole30. So I'm gonna go ahead and make do with what I have. And I think I have to do this part next before I can go back to work on the sleeves. I have been away from this project again for quite some time, but I finished the petticoat. Looks very nice. So I've got 
this twill tape as the waistband. I realized that this fabric was only 44 inches wide, so it's under the recommended circumference for a petticoat for this era. So I decided I'm going to use this other linen to make a ruffle to extend the length and to have that fullness at the bottom that would be a more appropriate circumference for the hem. I'm doing the best with what I have. We will see how this goes. Oh, and also I am not hand gathering or hand stitching any of this ruffle. I just can't. So I am coming to terms with the fact that some things I can hand stitch and some things I can't, and that's okay. I'll save my energy for the things that I think people will actually notice, which is, you know, the cuff and some of the stuff up around the bodice. I don't think they're going to well, if they pay that much attention to the hem of my ruffle, they can just judge me all they want to. I just don't care at this point. So there's my petticoat all finished, which looks really good. So you can see I added the trim at the top of the ruffle. The ruffle gives me the fullness at the hem that I needed. I've come to the realization that this shift, which I have already altered once because it was too big, needs to be altered again. I am not loving this ruffle here. I feel like it limits what I can do with the costume I'm making now. Um, I don't know that I want the beige to show. I'd much rather have a ruffle out of black linen on the sleeves on this jacket. I'm going to cut it right here and I'm going to keep this ruffle as something that I can pin in or stitch in on another bodice somewhere along the way. And the sleeve is so big that it's hard to get into the jackets that I've made. The sleeve is a size 20. I realized well after the fact I probably should have made a size 14 or 16. There, it's done. Here's a dart that I took from right up at the very top all the way down to the bottom to about a half an inch um, width. So that took out almost an inch of the circumference here at the bottom of the sleeve. And I decided to put a little decorative stitching around there. And now I have these extra ruffles. I am gonna hang on to them. It's not work that's wasted. It's just not gonna be on the shift. So this will give me more flexibility with wearing the shift with multiple outfits. I have shown these before. These are the three jackets on page 84 of Patterns of Fashion 1. And I'm basically doing this jacket and I'm kind of doing a mashup between this with the shorter sleeves and this style of cuff. It's just a rectangle and you basically, you know, you sew two of them, stitch them together, turn them around and then pleat them and close the opening, um, I think. The nice thing about Patterns of Fashion is they have descriptions of each of the antique pieces that they're recreating in this book. And it says that the fabric of this jacket is dated circa 1760 to 1770, but it said that the cuffs of this style are an earlier style. So the 1760s would have had this sort of cuff, which is shaped. Um, instead of pleated and they said it may have been made for an older lady who preferred this style because it's easier to make So I thought that was interesting. It's perfect for me as I have never done it before. So Easy to make sounds great. I have just enough to cut out two sets of cuffs and I'm gonna have to do some construction puzzling to figure out the order of operations because there is no order of operations and I screwed up. The problem with being a slow maker is that I don't end up working from start to finish in a day, you know, or two days. I end up doing it over the course of weeks. And I have not looked at these cuffs in weeks. And I very clearly wrote on here, add seam allowance. And I just cut them out without seam allowance. So I was a little concerned about the scale, which I shouldn't be, I guess, because that is an 18th century scale. But I guess that just took care of the problem for me because now they're going to be shorter and narrower all the way around. Okay, so order of operations. I think I will stitch it into a tube. Long way, long way. Turn it right side out and press it. That will leave me with these two raw edges. And they have to get sewn together at some point. But they also need to be pleated. Okay, I've stitched my cuffs. I've turned them and it occurred to me that I might be able to try the English stitch. And if you don't know what that is, it's a method of stitching so that you are finishing the inside and the outside at the same time and the seam will lay completely flat. I have folded in a quarter of an inch roughly inside the cuff here and that is the seam allowance. 
and we're going to give this a go. So essentially on the English stitch, you start your thread in there and you put your pieces together. So you end up with four pieces of fabric and you basically weave your way through. So I'm going to start by stitching through not this outer layer, but these three inner layers. Now, when I come back the other direction, I'm going to skip the outside piece and go through these three layers. And then we'll repeat ourselves. We're going to go through these three. And we're going to skip the outside and go through the other three. And you just work your way along the whole seam that way. And it's supposed to make a nice, neat finish. And because it will lay flat, it hopefully will reduce some of the bulk in my seam so that when I go to fold up those pleats, uh, it won't be quite so bulky. So I'm hoping this works. I have never used this stitch before. I think this is one of those things that's kind of a happy, <laughs> happy remembrance. I do watch a lot of YouTube videos about making these costumes. And sometimes those little bits of information get sort of filed away and they come back to you at the opportune time. So let's see how, what our progress looks like. It's a little awkward when you do anything for the first time. Yes, that that's perfect. So can you see how this is nice and neat and finished there? And on the outside, it lays flat. That is a fabulous solution. So, you know, it's my first time of doing this. It's not perfect, but this is the inside. And then the outside just looks like a regular seam. So it was quick and easy to do. And I'm definitely going to use this in my future um, dressmaking. So I can see that I could improve, like my edges weren't perfectly lined up. And so I kind of has, you know, I have this little bit of unevenness right here, but you know, for a first attempt, I'm pretty proud of that. And I will try and get the next one to be lined up a little bit better. It's a lot less bulk than I expected now. So it should be pretty easy for me to put in my um, pleats. And it's going to look like that. It's hard to see, I think, with the pattern. But there's our, there's our pleats right there. This finished cuff is going to end up being about five inches wide. And... Uh, like nine and a half inches long. And then this part down here is like two and a half uh, where the pleats are. I ended up stitching in the ditch along the seam right here to tack down the folds. And then on the back, I stitched right along here for about two inches on either side of the center seam. And that just kind of controls those folds and keep the, keeps them in place. Um, but I didn't have any visible top stitching on the outside, but I'm happy with the way this cuff turned out. It looks really great. So anyway, I just wanted to show the detail of that because once I get it on the sleeve, this will not be visible anymore. Progress update. I have assembled the sleeves completely and now it's time to pin them into place. And I am going to base these because the last time I made one of these jackets, I struggled with the placement of the sleeve and you have to have this sleeve seam in the right place. It's not where you think it would be. You don't put it like where your side seam would be right under your armpit. You kind of rotate it forward and it's just sort of like right here in the arm side, right on this part. So I am placing it and there's always a little bit of extra up in the sleeve. So you put in a couple of pleats, but they should be more toward the back of the sleeve. I'm going to go ahead and baste it and then we'll see how this fits on my arm. Um, if it's in a good place, I'll stitch it in. But that's that's the, the key thing to look for is that this seam on the sleeve needs to be more forward in the arm side than you think. All right, it's a new day and I did something I don't usually do and I had to clean my studio before continuing. That linen and that linen fray like crazy. So I had fibers everywhere. I had a couple of seams I had to redo, so the threads from that were everywhere. So it was just a mess and I didn't like it. But here's my progress. I have finished the sleeves and installed them. Here I've got some nice little pleats at the top of the sleeve head. I've got my fun cuff and I made a ruffle. So the ruffle is attached to the sleeve underneath and then the 
cuff is installed over that and you can see how it's open at the back like that. I also added a fun little detail. I added these little buttons here right above each of the pleats. One thing I noticed is that when I was uh, attaching the skirt to the top, my lining was a little bit tighter than the outer fabric. And so the outer fabric kind of had a little bit of sagging. So I just smoothed it up like this and put some pins in. You can see it's not much at all. When I install the trim, that will take care of that and keep it in place. The Patterns of Fashion top that I am matching has a trim on it. So I'm going to sew that on and I played around with it just a little bit. Here, I'm gonna go back over here. First of all, I thought this was polyester trim and it's not, it's rayon. The thing that I was realizing is that this trim is more narrow than the trim in Patterns of Fashion. And I think if I have a black stomacher, I don't want this to be black against black. I want a little bit of contrast. So I am playing around with just putting it on about a half an inch from the edge and seeing how that looks. Here's my update. I've made my new stomacher, which is just two layers of linen, a few lines of boning, and I did add a little ruffle to the top. And then here I've made two lacing strips. They're five inches long. That's the finished length. I did insert a piece of boning here and I've got four eyelets. I'm stitching this onto the finished jacket. So I wanna make sure that I can sew them in where I can cover the stitching with my trim. And I also wanna make sure that there's room for the stomacher to be able to pin in there too. So if you'll see on the back here, I have marked my seam allowance. So there'll be one inch finished. I'll stitch them on here. I'll trim the seam allowance and then I'll fold them back. The finished lacing strip will be about that big and that'll just tuck in um, underneath the, the jacket opening. I can lace it to fit and then the stomacher can fit in there as well. I can stitch this as far as an inch and a half away from the edge of the fabric and it would still cover up with this. And I wanted to mention that these are scraps of canvas. So they do stretch a little bit in this direction but not at all in that direction. And so that's what you wanna pay attention to with whatever fabric you use for any kind of lacing. So anything that's gonna be under tension, like a corset, you wanna make sure it doesn't stretch in this direction. Here's what they look like inside. I'm going to attach the trim and then I can tack them this way. And you can see they rest just inside the edge of the jacket. And it would have been nice to have black, but I didn't have any black canvas and nobody's gonna see them anyway. The stitching line is right here, but my trim, if I go, you know, about a half an inch away from the edge, which is what I'm thinking would look nice, then that will cover up that stitching line perfectly. Uh, and I can sew it on without interfering with the eyelets. So I'll stitch that on right like that and then tack that over that way. Just a, a few stitches right along here to keep it facing the right direction. I am ready to start stitching down the trim. Here's a seam that is hidden in one of the pleats. I'm just gonna use my seam gauge as I go just to make sure I'm sticking it about that half an inch away from the edge. When I did the little bit on my petticoat, it was like super easy. You just stitch right on top of the center stitching uh, from when it was manufactured. I have just almost eight and a half yards of it and I have plenty. Uh, I'll even have some left over maybe to trim a hat or something like that. So I'm not worried about it. But what I did was press down the pleats because some of them had gotten wrinkled in storage. I have had this trim for years upon years. Either Hancock Fabrics went out of business or Joanne Fabrics moved. I know I bought a lot of things at both of those sales because the prices were just so good. The uh, sticker on it says $9.99 a yard and it might have been, I don't know, 90% off or something like that. And I don't even know if they charged me for the actual yardage. They may have just said $5 for the bolt or something like that. It was about that good of a deal. There's what we're looking like. That's a nice distance away. It's enough to show some of the colors uh, and give some contrast against the black petticoat. There it is on my dress form. It's all sewn and trimmed and ready to put on with the rest of the pieces of this costume. I'm super excited and I cannot wait. So let's do a little bit of a getting dressed video, shall we?
historically adequate shoes are Latin dance shoes that I ordered from Amazon for about $30 and I just switched out the laces for ribbon and added a shoe clip. As you can see, I'm thrilled with how this project turned out, but there are a couple of things that need to be adjusted. The ruffle isn't working for me on the top of the stomacher. The stomacher is also too wide and doesn't fit in where I had the lacing strips, so I'm going to have to redo that. And you can see my waistline is too high. I just don't know how that happened. What you gonna do? I'm not taking it apart at this point. I'll just make a note for the next time I make one of these jackets to really pay attention to that waistline. I thought I had it figured out and it was pretty good on my lining, but somehow in the making up of it and the putting on of it, the waist is just about a half an inch too short and on the last one it was about a half an inch too long. So I've messed up in the wrong direction. <laughs> But I love how it looks and it fits wonderfully across the back. And you can see how the ruffle helped with the fullness of the hem. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video and I hope you learned a thing or two along the way. I have a couple of other ideas for moving forward in the next couple of videos. You've heard of capsule wardrobes. Well, I'm making a capsule 18th century wardrobe. Since I already have petticoats and now a couple of bodices, I'd like to make another bodice out of this fabric. This is a Pier 1 Imports curtain panel that I found at a thrift store and it picks up the same green color of my petticoat. So I'm looking forward to making another bodice variation using this fabric. That'll be an upcoming video. Then I'd like to make an outfit using some wool. This would be more suitable for winter wear. So I have this beautiful black wool that is just enough for a petticoat and I have this very nice burgundy wool that I think is just enough for an 18th century bed gown. What I want to do for that is use an actual 18th century pattern that I found online, actual 18th century instructions to make that. So stay tuned for that. If you like what you see here and you don't want to miss these next couple of videos, be sure to subscribe down below. You can also follow me on Instagram where I'll be posting updates on these projects as I work on them. As always, thanks for watching and have a great day.